In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. You, um, when you were mentioning some of the problems earlier, you mentioned growth. So um, can we continue to have global GDP growth? I mean, growth, growth has lifted a lot of people out of poverty and improved a lot of people's lives. But have we, have we reached the limit, do you think? Is, is nature now telling us to stop growing? Oh, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, <laughs> I mean in answer to your final question, yes, clearly. I mean, you, you look at the graph of human population and then you look at the graph of population of everything else and they aren't going in the same direction. Um, and it's it's pretty strange in a context where, as you say, all the all the scientists studying the matter are telling us that the natural world, the non-human world, is 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 collapsing under the weight of our economy. And then we're supposed to cheer when we hear that our economy is growing faster. That that yeah. does seem a, a pretty difficult tension Just to hold without bizarre. Without yeah. On the other hand, um, one of the things I find very interesting about David Fleming's work is that he's a little he's a little wary of the kind of three cheers for degrowth approach um, because he says it, it's very easy for people who've lived their whole lives in a period of growth to not realize what it's done for them. <laughs> mm. um, you know, he, he quotes that famous line, war is sweet to those who know it not. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very easy to imagine that that degrowth just means everyone consuming a bit less and you know working a bit less hard and, and having a nicer time of it. Um, whereas there are sort of inherent issues in the way that our economic systems are built that means in the in the absence of economic growth um, that can trigger the kind of collapse scenarios that a lot of people are, are stuck in. So we, we've yeah. sort of ended up in, in, in what I sometimes call the economic growth dilemma. You know, either we either we stop growing and so collapse the economies on which we all depend or we keep growing and collapse the ecology on which we all depend. Yeah. Um, and that there is no nice, easy answer here. Like the, the nice, easy answer would be to to back up a century or so and then go a different route. Um, so, yeah, I don't I don't really subscribe to the idea that, you know, all we need is to switch to degrowth and then somehow everything continues oh. as is. No, and also um, it's, it's degrowth is not a word you can use if you're talking to Africans, for example. It's, it's, right. How can they degrow? It's it's. You know, some parts of the world need to grow, and some and some definitely need to shrink. I don't know what. Uh, but, but really, Americans what's need. important here is is the definitions. I mean, the word growth is so nebulous. I mean, obviously, you know, we want our gardens to grow, and we want our children to grow, and you know, growth is not a bad thing. And and you were talking about GDP growth GDP growth yeah. initially, um, but even that, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance around, you know, well, how about if we change from GDP growth to this slightly different measure? And that's a whole other conversation. I think what's really exciting for me to get away from all this kind of pernickety economic speak um, is that David really holds out this vision of what we need to focus on is neither the growth nor the degrowth of the market economy, but actually growth of that, of that informal economy, of the economy of of all the things we love, the economy of, 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 of friendship and care and, and volunteering and, and family and music and play and conviviality. Like this is all the stuff that's been squeezed out because there's not room for anything other than mm. money in our society. And really what he's saying is let's rebuild those things, not only because we desperately miss them, but also because as a, as a historian, as well as an economist, he sort of looked back to the period before kind of, um, growth-based market economics over the last couple of hundred years and said, well, how did societies sustain themselves then? And really the answer is culture and conviviality. It's, it's that, um, you know, back then, you know, in some places in Europe, for example, the um, holidays amounted to five months of the year. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, how does that, how does that happen? You know, here we are in this technologically advanced society where machines are doing loads of the manual labor for us. And yet we're all working vastly harder than people were in the Middle Ages. Like, how is that? And the answer is, as he explains, is, is essentially 
our economic system and and back then all that all that time of, of holidays wasn't spent just you know it wasn't it wasn't laziness that was time for for culture you know for mm. for carnival and for connection and and that was what held people and communities together in the absence of things like full unemployment and economic growth um so i, I won't attempt to you know recite his entire mm. his entire thesis but um but for me that's very exciting to realize that our kind of longing for these um, joyous elements of life that are squeezed out by our by our busyness and the, the grim reality of modern economics are actually not just some kind of quaint and obsolete longing. They really do represent that which are economic in the broad sense of the word that our systems are, are lacking to make a, a future worth surviving. Mm. But what, what about infrastructure? I mean, uh, fair enough, yeah, we need to change the culture and uh, human interactions and human behaviour. But what kind of infrastructure do we need? We still need to produce things. We, need, we still need to provide things for ourselves. W with what infrastructure? Uh, what, what's the thrust of your question specifically? I mean, obviously, people have always produced things and, and, and made things and collaborated to do that and got hold of materials with, with all kinds of different levels of infrastructure. And indeed, around the world, people do so today. But it seems like you have a particular thing in mind when you say infrastructure well not a particular thing i mean a particular range of thing a particular type of thing um I, I mean we're looking at infrastructure that uh doesn't have a growth imperative number one which is the which is the ecological aspect and doesn't concentrate wealth uh and if you have concentrated wealth obviously you can't have democracy you can't have both of those things mm -hmm. and so uh you know we look there's there's we're looking at lots of different kinds of infrastructure that doesn't concentrate wealth and doesn't have to force the economy to grow forever uh, those kind of things that you're interested in as well well absolutely i mean this is as you say the the kind of reframing that's necessary is to um rather than sort of being realistic and assuming that nothing's fundamentally going to change and how do we how do we tinker at the edges of it you know we need to be asking you know how would culture and producing things and feeding ourselves and sheltering ourselves how would that look if we were going to do it in a world with as many people as we've got today um in a way that didn't destroy our foundational capital which as, as you said at the start is 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 the ecological health of the world as well as our kind of cultural health um so yes yes is the short answer that's absolutely um the question i mean the What's what's very interesting, I think, again, in David's work is that he uh, looks at these um, regrettable necessities, as he calls them, you know, all of the, the, the scale infrastructure that's necessary to support mm. this, this, this growth based society. Um, and argues that a lot of that, in fact, becomes becomes unnecessary um, as we extract ourselves from from that kind of cultural mindset and begin to um as i say focus more on the growth of the things that that actually matter and the growth of the things that can grow you know to an unlimited extent um as opposed to things which yeah you know, fundamentally draw down foundational capital and consequently have have limits yeah i guess um, i noticed that uh, jonathan porritt wrote the foreword to mm -hmm. Logic. He's, he also wrote capitalism as, as if the world mattered. And I, I, I had some problems with that. I mean, I think he understands that we can't have perpetual growth on a finite planet. I'm not 100% sure, but I think he does. But he wants to um, reform capitalism rather than build something to replace it. I don't know how you would take the growth imperative out of capitalism. I mean, all, all, all capitalists want to return on their investments. And if a majority don't get it, we it falls into recession. We can't seem to stabilize capitalism, can we? Um, so we, we need to transition to something else to transcend it, if you like, um, don't we? Uh, well, I would say yes, of course, it depends how broadly you define capitalism. But um, I mean, with regard to Jonathan Porritt in particular, I can answer that very directly. Um, and indeed, I can give you a, a link to put under this video to uh, uh, a 10 minute edit of uh, one of the launch events for Lean Logic and Surviving the Future, which I invited Jonathan to join, uh, because he and David were lifelong friends, really. And they they were sort of known as David and Jonathan at the very heart of the Green Party when it was right. getting going in this in this country. Um, and 
yeah, there's this very interesting little 10 minute edit of Jonathan addressing this exact question and saying that, um, you know, he and David would have endless rows about exactly this basically, because, right. um, because, you know, Jonathan would always be thinking about, you know, what can we do to, um, you know, make this culture a little bit more sustainable or, you know, move it, move it towards less destructive practices. Whereas David's starting point, even back then was always, okay, you know, I guess there might be a case for a little bit of mitigation work, but ultimately the, the question is, you know, how is this going to prepare us for the collapse that we're inevitably headed towards? And the mitigation, um, and, the mitigation work can buy us a, a bit of time maybe. Well, yeah, but even that is a very interesting question. You know, I, I remember I used to talk to David about this, you know, he'd say, well, on the one hand, you know, is, is delaying the crash actually a good thing? You know, because, you know, the longer this society carries on, the more nuclear power stations it builds, the more forests it cuts down, etc. You know, there is a case, you could argue, that, you know, the sooner it ends, the better. On the other hand, yeah. as you say, if, if, if we use that time for, um, for preparation and, and being in a better place, which is exactly what things like the transition movement do, yeah. um, then it could be a very good thing. So, I mean, I guess as ever, you know, people say, People say time heals, don't they? But it very much depends on what you do with that time. Mm. Um, and I think the same applies to, to civilizations. Um, and so, yeah, Jonathan, um, very interesting. I, I heartily recommend this little 10 minute clip where he sort of, he, he talks about um, people like myself who go around with all these illusions about what might be, might be possible. <laughs> it's a very strange thing to hear, as opposed to someone like David who kind of grasped the, the grasp the nettle and was like okay well what would it actually look like to move into a post-growth society and and in no way painted that as a as a you know rosy utopia um but nonetheless you know was willing to face up to what the data tells us is happening essentially mm, i'd be really interesting I'll, 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 I'll look forward to that yeah um, well i'll send it to you and then you can add it to the uh, yeah i will the, um so something else i wanted to talk about i believe that you're going off to start a community in Ireland. Um, it, I, is that right? Uh, I, and I, I think, again, are you going to live without tech, without technology as much as you possibly can? And what will that look like? Okay, so that's sort of true. Um, so there's, um, my, my best friend is a guy called Mark Boyle, who um, used to be known as the Moneyless Man. The Moneyless Man, yeah. For three years. Um, I know you know him as well, Dave. And um, uh, and then after, uh, and so we met after he'd lived for a year without money. Um, and I came out of this sort of community activism background with transition and the like. Uh, and he'd been doing this thing. And I read his first book, The Man is Man, and thought, "Wow, this is this is amazing." And essentially, his motivation was, like most of us, he kind of looked at the world and thought, "You know, it's all going to hell. What what can I do about it?" And he thought, "Well." almost everyone I know who's doing something they don't believe in, they're doing it for money. Yeah. So what if I just gave up money? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there's a whole book about what he did living in a, in a caravan on a field where a farmer let him stay and all of this stuff. Um, but after a year of that, he was like, firstly, I've never been happier, so I'm going to carry on. But secondly, it doesn't really work a, as a solitary endeavor ultimately. Um, you know, eventually he's going to get sick or injured or whatever, and there has to be some kind of communal element to it, even though he'd never been healthier. Um, and so we started looking together at creating some kind of um, moneyless community. Um, that's when we got involved with the Ecological Land Cooperative. We were originally going to start doing it there, but eventually um, Mark moved back to Ireland, to Galway, County Galway, um, because we found a, a a small holding, about three acres, um, that with, ironically, perhaps the proceeds from the Moneyless Man, he had enough money to to buy the small <laughs> holding, and that seemed like seemed like an appropriate thing to do with that money. Actually, was to use it to create a space where other people could come and exist in that in that spirit of the gift. Uh, and so, on that land, there's a um, a moneyless pub called the Happy Pig, or perhaps an inn would be a better term because it's. There's a bunkhouse and people can come and stay for free and, and, you know, just have a place where it's possible to exist without having to find money for rent or mortgage and having to sell yourself in the marketplace in order to just exist. The happy pig. Um, the happy pig. That's a, so philosophical question. That's a philosophical question, isn't it? Would you rather be a happy pig or a depressed 
human. That's Socrates, in fact. Yeah, it was, it was Socrates. Socrates who said it's, it's far better to be a um, Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Yeah. Uh, and we disagree with that so whole, wholeheartedly that we um, <laughs> called it the happy pig. And also it was actually made from when, when uh, Mark and his partner bought the land, um, there was a, a kind of pigsty there um, and the, the happy pig was built on the foundations of this pigsty. So that's another element right. of the name. So would you, would you choose the happy pig option? Uh, option as opposed to? If you, had the, if, you, if you were given the option, you can be a depressed human or a happy oh, pig. Oh, God. You, you oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry, I thought you meant the place. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd, I'd be a would happy pig. Oh, no, I'd, I'd, I would definitely be a depressed human. <laughs> <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't press a button and let go of my... I don't know, my humanity, my intellect, my frontal lobe. Uh -huh. I couldn't do it. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, I definitely would. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, loving life. Actually, most, um, people, most people I've spoken to would. But there's a, there's a, a right. few just couldn't let go of their humanity. Right. So, so yeah, so um, there's the happy pig on the land. And then Mark also built himself uh, a cabin from, from the local woods um because he had by this point in his thinking come to the point of thinking well lots of people are living off grid but nobody's really showed me how you build a solar panel in a sustainable way um and so uh so he decided to give up electricity uh and so he built wow. himself a cabin uh where he's been living for the last four years i think um are you going to give up electricity as well has, no i'm not um but i'll come to that um so he's been so he's been living without without electricity, without running water. And um, there's a spring very nearby that we walk to each morning to get our water. Um, and then also on the land, there's the kind of uh, traditional Irish farmhouse um, that was there. Um, and so, uh, I mean, it's a long story, but now we've, we've taken the whole place into a kind of um, shared ownership model. Um, there are six of us now who are co-owners and, and see it basically as Kind of buying the land out of slavery if you like um yeah. you know rather than seeing it as some kind of investment or whatever we see that as you know we put that money and we never expect to see it back but now that place can exist in a way that um yeah that people don't need to have money to to be there um and so uh i'm i've, I've had quite a nomadic existence my whole life i don't i don't fly or drive but um ever since i was a child i've kind of been in a moving moving around kind of a lifestyle um, and so that's one of my bases and has been one of my bases for several years. Um, and when I'm there, there's a room in the farmhouse where I stay and um, there is electricity there. Um, all the heating is done by wood that we go and cut and right. uh, harvest. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a minimal tech way of life, but it's not, um, it's not electricity free in the way that Mark is. Mark's very keen for others who want to explore um getting away from technology more and more to to be there um because this is really his answer to the question you were asking earlier you know how do we build ways of life that are not dependent on things that are annihilating our life support systems um okay. and uh, so julius another one of our residents there um has the interesting kind of contradiction of, of running a youtube channel that explores um, sort of wilderness survival skills and low-tech living, and he's building himself a um, a kind of uh, stone age dwelling, um, which uh, which he's planning to um, live in from this spring, I believe. For a year. So the, the aim is to help other people live in this in a similar way. Yeah, the aim is to kind of create a, a bastion of. Um, the non-monetary economy and, and low tech or no tech, depending on how you define technology, um, ways of life. And, you know, the people that, that come and are there will obviously determine what that looks like in practice. But the, the six of us who are kind of based there at present are at various levels of that and, and all just really support each other in, in exploring this and, and, as I say, creating a space for the non-monetary economy which sounds really radical to modern ears like living without money like people can just come and stay for free like how on earth but in many ways i see that as just rekindling the ancient irish tradition of hospitality you know yeah, someone turns yeah. up at your door you give them a bed it's it's not actually a new thing it's it's an old thing that we've forgotten and i think there's a there's a um there's a line in mark's most recent book 
the way home tales from life without technology which i love and he says um i can quote it exactly but he says something like techno utopians will always warn you to be very wary of romanticizing the past uh on that i agree and i know it firsthand um having got my my hands bloody and and mucky um but be far more careful of those who romanticize the future yeah 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 techno utopianism is a uh it's it's so depressing that people think technology can solve all of our problems it's just hopeless so you're not going to live there full time that's right yeah you know, okay so because yeah. i i used to live in an intentional community but um and it was lovely i loved it. i lived in a community for 13 years i was a shepherd for three years believe it or not and I, I, I got frustrated in the end because so much energy was needed to run the community to do the jobs and to maintain relationships not enough energy was left over to look at wider change uh, right. and I was, I, I was worried that unless we challenge centralized power at some point that centralized power could come along and say this is our land now goodbye get off um yep. are you not are you not scared that uh that kind of community will sap people's energy and to look at the bigger picture and and that the hold on the land won't be secure in the long run as long as this centralized power still exists good questions um so to answer the first about community draining energy thus far that hasn't been our experience at all um we uh, I mean, as you know, I've been involved with things like the Ecoland Corp um, in the past, and the model there is this sort of um, clustered model of uh, allowing people to kind of have their own independent space that exists as sort of very close neighbours, essentially, rather than the kind of, um, you know, big house community model of, you know, 200 people coming together in meetings to agree everything. Um, and the, the way that we've structured our, our decision making there feels pretty light. Um, and so for me so far, the experience um, of being in and around that place over the last few years has been one of, of support. Um, you know, we're all very interested in, in the same things. It's really good to be in a space that's around a bunch of other people who believe in the things that you do and are, and are committed to, to living that. Um, and yes, I mean, especially when um, we were going through the change of, of moving to this um, shared ownership model rather than it originally being just Mark and his partner who, who bought the land. Um, that was very time consuming, very draining and, you know, agreeing all the stuff around how we wanted to live together and all of that stuff. Absolutely. But now that that's in place, um, so far, it's, it's felt really good. And the second part of your question about the, the kind of security of the land. I mean, in some ways, I guess we've taken the middle path on that because we have bought the land, which is obviously a way of um, asserting some kind of right to it within the structure mm. of the current dominant system. Um, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the past um, living around and working on kind of squatting and, and these kind of concepts. And that's that can be very draining because you create something incredibly beautiful and then it just gets taken away and destroyed and you have to start mm. from scratch again and again. So hopefully by having kind of overarching collective ownership of the land, that gives us some kind of security in that front. Um, and then ultimately, if you're talking about, you know, you know, if what we're doing becomes threatening enough, then the powers that be come along. Um, I mean, that's that's absolutely valid. I think one of the most inspiring things I've heard in a long time was a, a talk I went to a few weeks ago about the the ZAD in France, the ZAD in France, um, and uh, what's that? I mean, that's that's a whole other long story. Um, but I mean, in essence, it's a it's a four thousand acre area that was designated for an international airport. Um, was sort of oh, they squatted by... it. They it was a plateau, and they squatted it. Oh, I've yeah. been there. I've been there. I didn't know it was called right. ZAD. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there, well, so, ago, yeah. yeah, ZAD is a kind of French acronym that in, in government linked language stands for um, like the zone to be developed. Um, oh, yeah, right. uh, but then it kind of got re uh, reused as an acronym and is now described as the zone to be defended. Um, and uh, and yeah, with immense local support, sort of 40,000 people came down because the government did indeed come along with tanks and riot, literally tanks and riot police to invade yeah. this place and get people out. 
and they're still there and the government yeah, yeah. Have, have eventually backed down and um accepted that they can be there long term um so that's that's a whole other story i don't think that's what we're going to end up doing in ireland but um if people are interested in those questions like again i'll, I'll send you the link to this incredible talk by two people who've, who've been living there for a long time um which i saw a few weeks ago which um, Jay Jordan and, and Isabel Frameau um, is just a huge source of inspiration for me. But in terms of the land in Ireland, I think ultimately that um, we found a measure of security by purchasing the land. Um, but again, I don't think that money is going to be a very secure basis for security as we move into the future we're moving into. I think a lot of us have been trained to think that it's, you know, savings and pensions that we should look to for future security and in my opinion again it's it's relationships in nature um i see our security on that land as being grounded in the relationships that we're building with the neighbors with the fact that the people there care about us and support us and if anyone tried to shift us on we'd all we'd all defend each other and stand yeah. up for each other yeah, yeah, um, yeah that's 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 the true basis of um of the security that you're talking about i, I agree completely um and as you know, um, mutual credit has been my big thing for a few years now. Um, moneylessness, well, I mean, to me, that's I, I don't call it a form of money. I, I, I call it a form of moneyless trading. It's just mm -hmm. numbers in accounts. There's no money that you can hold in your hand. Well, no. <laughs> There's a, uh, an exponent of the moneyless economy. Popped yes. Into yes, she's a scrounger, though. <laughs> Um, so is mutual credit moneyless in your book? Could you see yourself ever having a mutual credit account and, and exchanging things on account in the mutual credit system? Well, I mean, I, I have a bank account, so I could certainly see myself having a mutual credit account. But uh, in terms of the theory, um, I would I would say it's it's a lot of the way there. Um, you know, it's uh, it gets rid of all the things that money is tied into. I mean, money is tied into this huge gambling, money spinning, corrupt operation, and there's no getting away from that. You know, money's value is being inflated away all the time. Um, and mutual credit doesn't have that. So it's an, an immense improvement. I would say that it's, it's not quite as radical as a, a kind of full gift economy where you're you're not even you're not even keeping tallies you're just like well right. i love this person so i'm going to help them and and they love me so they're going to help me and and actually you're the guy who you know sings opera and i'll play every christmas so we need to make sure you're okay and you know actually grounding things in, yeah. in relationships that aren't quantified um i, is something I would, that I I would find call that um, i would call that informal mutual credit it's sort of right, you, you, yeah. you keep you keep the accounts in your head rather than in a notebook. Yeah, I think or that's a, fair. Digitally. I think that's fair because there's always a sense of you know that friend who like even though none of it's quantified, we've got that friend who always takes more than they give, and you all feel a bit uncomfortable about it. And um, so I do think there is a kind of informal, rough tally going on in all social relationships. But but I, I would be wary. I would be wary of. I would be wary of saying what I just said actually because I mean. <laughs> It's it's not quite it's not quite Italian. I think that's a dangerous analogy. It's a bit like when we talk about spending time on something. I'm sort of training myself out of that phrase because I don't like yeah. the analogy of time to money. Like time is not money. It's a fundamentally yeah, yeah, different yeah, yeah, thing, yeah, and yeah. I don't spend it. Like time is just always there. Whatever yeah. I'm doing, there's time. It's it's not a it's not a thing that I can speed up or slow down you or don't change keep, or give away. Yeah, um, you don't keep so tallies with your family, that, do you? Right, and the idea that you know that I've got even an informal rough tally with my mum to think about you know how many yeah. things she's done for me and how many yeah. things I've done for her yeah I'm, I'm not totally comfortable with that I think this is something fundamentally different which is grounded not in maths but in yeah love um well, I guess if you wanted some plumbing work done and uh none of your friends did any plumbing but there was a local plumber down the road who you didn't know that that love relationship wouldn't be there so you'd need to keep a tally somehow I, I guess Exactly. And and again, if you look at the dictionary for the future and how to survive it, it talks about this. It talks about the different scales um, and how you have your kind of close in group where everything operates on the gift economy. And then you've got your community group where, you know, you'd probably lend each other money at no interest, but you probably would expect it back. Um, you know, and then you've got your city scale where you've got a lot of things in common culturally and you probably choose them over these other people if you had to trade with someone. But, you know, you're still going to pay for it. 
Um, and so, yeah, I think that's that's just human that um, as things become further and further from the center of my personal network, yeah. um, those relationships inevitably become, we, we keep a tally a bit more. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is, of course, the origin, and that, and that's been really ridiculed in our culture. You know, the whole "are you local" thing, right? But that's essentially the question: is like, are you part of my local gift economy, uh, or are you someone that I need to be a bit more careful about because actually nobody knows who you are, and you might just disappear tomorrow. Yeah, um, or is your is your presence in our community to extract wealth from it, right? For, for shareholders somewhere else, um, exactly. or or does your work and does your presence here? Are you, are you intending to keep the wealth that's generated in this community in this community? Right. And so I'd love difference. to see, you know, I'd love to see a happy pig in every community that operates on a completely gift economy basis. But then if I wanted to, you know, exchange something with people over in France or, you know, the, the, a certain distance away to have a mutual credit system that, that dealt with that, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Completely compatible. Um, but I, But I do think that at the at the immediate local level, we can be even more radical than mutual credit. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't it be superb for every community to have a mutual credit club and a, a happy pig community on the outskirts and all, all at the heart of it? Um, where can people keep up to speed with what you're up to, Sean? Uh, well, my website is darkoptimism.org. Uh, I'm on Twitter too as Dark Optimism. Um, as I mentioned, the, the courses are the big thing I'm working on at the moment. Um, we're launching the uh, so we have a we have a an asynchronous course called the Path Through Tumultuous Times. So that's something people can take any time, whenever they want, in their at right. their own speed. Um, and there's also a, a live eight week course we call the Deeper Dive, um, which is a, where we sort of take a small group of people, around fifty people, and 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 really collectively go deeper into that and, and forge some some meaningful relationships with some of the most sort of compelling thinkers and doers around today. Uh, and the next deeper dive is starting on the 31st of January. Right. Um, okay. And we run those annually, basically each winter. Um, so yeah, all of all of that stuff, darkoptimism.org is your is your source for all things me. Right. So I've got lots of links to put in the description. I'll get those, I'll harvest those from you. Um, oh. and uh, yeah, just as a, finally, just to say to people, do check out Sean's course. Uh, there'll be a link in the description. I, I guess if they click on the link, there'll be a it will show the contents of the course. Yeah, yeah, we'll put the link and it's got all the all the details you could right, ever okay, need. Brilliant. And um, and if people want to contact me, then they can do so through Twitter or through my website if they've got more questions. Great. So really fantastic talking with you, Sean, as usual. It's been and, a joy, uh, Dave. And thanks for all you do, man. It's it's you're you're an absolute superstar in the movement and your website. I actually shared lowimpact.org with um with a, a colleague over in America who, who'd never heard of it at all. And she was just like, oh my God, like this is the thing I've been looking for for my whole life. This oh really? I'm gonna share this with everybody I know. So that's good to hear. Um, yeah, yeah. So keep doing what you're doing, man. And thank you. Yeah, and just keep making it bigger. <laughs> Cheers and Sean. Cheers, Dave. <laughs>